Hello there. Welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world, whether you're in North America, Canada, the United Kingdom or Australia, anywhere. Welcome to the Saroy channel. And I just want to thank all my subscribers for your continued support of my channel. I truly appreciate it. And it's fantastic to see it growing like this. It's very exciting for me and it really does make it worthwhile. And if you are interested in these kind of stories and you love the big hairy man known as Bigfoot and you enjoy cryptid tales, well then this is definitely a good channel for you to subscribe to and I hope you will. Now tonight you're going to really love the story. What we have is a story here of imagine uh, a young man, well he's 16 years old, and he dresses up in a gorilla suit because he wants to scare his friends and make them think that they've actually seen a Bigfoot. But what he doesn't realize is that he's about to have an encounter with a hairy man all of his own. So let's get started. I know you're going to love tonight's story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, my name is Leslie and I live in Georgia with my husband Randall and my two sons, Victor 15 and Jesse 16. Well, that was their ages at the time of their Bigfoot encounter that happened in the year 2003. Sadly, I was not fortunate enough to meet the hairy man myself, but my son would differ in his opinion on that and say that I was very lucky indeed not to have crossed paths with this hairy ape-like humanoid that we choose to call Bigfoot Sasquatch abominable snowman, or even the Yeti. We live in a beautiful area of rustic North American countryside here, surrounded by the most enchanting mountainous valleys, as well as vast stretches of natural woodland filled with tall, majestic trees. I was very lucky to inherit this property from my grandmother, and it has been in our family for generations since the 1800s. The house itself is a more recent individualistic architect's creation that was built in 1988, which sets it apart from mainstream houses. But I like it because it blends in so perfectly with the flora and fauna in this idyllic Georgian landscape. The other thing that I love about my home is the huge glass windows in every single room that filter in all this glorious daylight and every day we enjoy overlooking those magical views of the amazing countryside that really does enrich the quality of our lives with a huge visual appreciation that we never ever take for granted. My children are the usual rambunctious teenagers more often than not up to no good, especially my youngest boy Victor, who is pranking people on a continuous basis. He has done things to scare me that invariably he always posts online, much to the amusement of all his delighted friends that are up for any laugh that is at my expense. There were times I would wake up and one time I remember finding a huge snake coiled on my chest and I found myself stroking this thing in the middle of the night only to wake up to find that it was a snake curled up on top of my chest. You cannot imagine how terrified I was. Another time I woke up to find several tarantulas crawling all over my skin and it was like being in the middle of the darkest nightmare you could imagine. Then there was the time my son brought some realistic looking poos which he placed on the living room carpets in strategic positions so that when my guests arrived for a dinner party he was able to recall their horrified expressions as they looked as if my dog had indeed been using the carpet as a toilet. So yes, my kid is a huge prankster, and I warned him once that this continuous joking would come back to haunt him one day. And little did I realize that my words would also come back to bite me. How one of my son's pranks would eventually end up going horribly wrong. One day we were all watching television and if you have teenage boys, you'll know that they're always fighting over the remote control and, of course, watch program to watch on television. I do remember one occasion my sons were killing themselves laughing over the series Finding Bigfoot. 
They thought it was hilariously funny that anyone could possibly believe that such a cryptid creature such as this actually existed somewhere in North America. My older son did say that he knew of a couple of boys at school who claimed to have had encounters with the cryptid creature, but he was certain that those boys were actually seeing bears rather than Bigfoot himself, and it was just a case of misidentification. One day, both of my sons were going on a camping trip into the woods to celebrate their cousin's 17th birthday party. And judging by the whispering going on in the back of my Jeep, I knew they were up to something very mischievous. I imagined that someone was going to be subject to Victor's pranks, and I was secretly relieved that it was not going to be me. When I dropped my kids off, I spoke to their supervisor, who was taking charge of the camping trip for the boys. He told me that he would keep a close eye on my boys and make sure they did not misbehave. All I could say to myself was, good luck to you. It was at the end of the weekend when I picked my sons up from their camping trip that I knew that something was terribly wrong with my younger son, Victor. He's a natural joker and always has a mischievous look on his face and a gr broad grin. But as I looked at him through the rear mirror in the car, I knew that something was distinctly off about him. He just appeared to be so down in the dumps, subdued and even depressed. As a mother, you can sense these things. How was your camping trip, Victor? I asked, looking at him through the rear mirror, hoping to see a positive reaction from him. He looked subdued and mumbled something that was barely audible under his breath, and immediately Jess came to his rescue. It was awesome, he said. We had a huge campfire every night, and we told the most scary ghost stories under the stars, and we roasted marshmallows. And yes, we went fishing on the Sunday, and I caught the most massive catfish, didn't I, Victor? Victor mumbled something under his breath that was barely audible. And then he just continued to look out of the car window with a long, faraway expression on his face, as if he was on another planet. It sounds lovely, I said. Did you catch anything, Victor? I did not fish, said Victor in a low, disinterested voice. Why not, I asked in surprise. Victor, you love fishing. I did not want to fish, snapped Victor in an insolent tone. Over the next few days, Victor was sullen, subdued and withdrawn. And even though he was in our home, the place became incredibly quiet because he barely spoke a word. He never ventured outside, not even once, and spent most of the time in his bedroom. Everything he did almost became robotic, as if he was just going through the motions, like when he went to school or sat at the dinner table. And he always looked willfully detached and disinterested in absolutely everything going on around him. It was like he was in another world. I noticed that my son Jesse kept covering up for him all the time, every time I asked a question. It was beginning to annoy me considerably. Every time I asked Victor to tell me what was going on with his brother, he would just shut up and say nothing. Finally, I had reached the end of my tether and I was determined to find out what was going on and I took my son Jesse to one side and I challenged him. What on earth is going on with Victor, I said. Ever since that camping trip, he's been distinctly offed. Did something upset him on that trip? You are right, Mum, someone upset him on that trip, but it's not who you think it was, said Jesse. What do you mean, I asked, not who I think it was. You're not making any sense. The thing that upset him, Mum, it wasn't human, said Jessie, and that's all I'm prepared to say. I promised Jess I wouldn't breathe a word about this to anyone, and I can't break that promise. But I'm your mother, I exclaimed. You cannot keep me in the dark about these things. Please, I beg you, tell me what's going on. Speak to Victor, not to me, said Jessie. Later that day, I sat down next to Victor on the settee. The television was blaring loudly on a program that didn't even interest Victor in the slightest. And he barely seemed to be focused on it, but as usual seemed to be miles away in a seemingly trance-like state. I know what's going on, I lied, taking him into my arms. Jessie told me everything about your camping drip 
and he told me all the things that have upset you. What? said Victor, looking horrified. He told you everything? I told him that he wasn't to breathe a word about anything, especially to you. He told me everything, I repeated. Suddenly, my son burst into tears and started to sob. I'd never seen him behave like that before. I was so frightened, Mum. I really thought this thing was going to kill me. I've never been so terrified in my entire life. It was then that my son revealed to me an extraordinary story that I myself could barely believe. It shook me to the core because picturing my son in that kind of scenario was every mother's worst nightmare. Well, ma'am, you know how I like tricking people, he said. Only too well, I said. I did know you were planning one of your pranks on the trip because I could tell by your expression that you were up to something and it didn't look like it was too good, I must add. Well, I did buy a gorilla costume to take to the camp and a Bigfoot foot stencil because I just wanted to hoax the boys on the trip by pretending to be Bigfoot. Oh, I said, I see. And I take it that your prank didn't go off too well. It went worse than not well, Mum. It was terrible. We wanted everyone at the camp to think that there was a Bigfoot loitering around our tents at night. We were going to bang the tents during the night and make funny growling sounds and leave large footprints around the tent to scare everybody. It seemed like a great idea at the time. Then the next day, during the daylight hours, I was going to hide behind the trees wearing a gorilla suit and making movements so that I would be seen by everyone. And they would think that they had encountered a Bigfoot. And some people would even take footage of me and post it on Lion. It just seemed like a great idea. Who was in on this prank with you, I asked. It was Jesse and our cousin Ivan. He was on it too because after all, it was his birthday bash. And so I didn't want to disclude him from the prank. Anyway, I wanted him to be part of it all because it was his birthday. So tell me, I said, what happened in your own words? Well, on the Saturday night, we had a campfire. And it was great, Mum. It was so lovely under the sky. And we were roasting marshmallows and telling creepy ghost stories when someone remarked how quiet it had become all of a sudden. It was true because the usual night sounds like crickets and owls and coyotes had all but disappeared. And one of the boys said that it could actually mean that there was a Bigfoot in the area. I must admit, it did feel menacing for some reason and everybody felt it. And some people commented that they felt that they were being watched by unseen eyes. I must admit, Mum, I felt it too, but I just brushed it off as my imagination being in overdrive because we'd been listening to all those scary stories and scaring each other senseless, so it was natural that we would be a little bit sensitive to our environment, and that's what I thought it was. Everyone laughed because a lot of the boys didn't believe in Bigfoot, just like me. I was pleased that people were discussing the subject of Bigfoot because I knew my pranks would even turn the hardened skeptics in our group into Bigfoot believers with my brilliant tricks. Oh, you are cruel, I tease. So typical of you. It was decided that Ivan and I would bang the tents during the night with our hands and stamp the Bigfoot markers around the muddy areas which we had deliberately prepared by wetting some soil close to the tents when no one was looking. We would also make growling sounds outside the tents to scare everyone. It was decided that Ivan and I would wake up at about one o'clock in the morning and set our plan into motion and we could hardly wait. When this was all happening, where was the supervisor who was looking after you, I asked. Oh, he was in another tent a little way from us, close enough to keep a good eye on us, but not close enough to impose on our fun. Okay, I said, go on then, let's hear the rest of it. I was lying fast asleep in the large tent, which I was sharing with eight other boys. There was another tent pitched next to ours, which Ivan was sleeping in with the other eight boys. I was awoken to the sound of pebbles pelting our tent, and everyone grew very alarmed, and I was secretly recording their actions. 
I thought Ivan was doing a brilliant job in scaring everyone, but I was a wee bit peeved that he'd not woken me up to involve me in the activity because we had both agreed that we would do this together. But I thought he may have struggled to wake me up and decided to do it himself. I remember thinking that he was very clever to have used pebbles to hit our tents instead of hands because the sound was brilliantly scary. Everyone inside our tent was on edge and frightened by the barrage of pebbles being pelted at us. And then very suddenly we heard this loud, low, guttural roar. Mum, I thought Ivan had made this noise and I did not know how he had done it, but it was brilliant because it was so real. Even I was shaking in my boots because the sound was terrifying. I was grinning like a Cheshire cat as people's terrified reactions in the tent and I was secretly filming them. I was thrilled by their reactions because they all looked so startled. One of the boys believed it was a Bigfoot throwing pebbles at us because it did not want us camping on its turf. The next morning someone spotted a huge footprint in the mud and I could not believe that Ivan had done such a brilliant job with the stencil impressions because the footprint looked incredibly real and everyone was taking pictures of it and talking among themselves excitedly. I did not say anything to Ivan about the previous night and he said nothing to me. It turned out that he thought I had initiated all the pranks without him and vice versa. So you mean, I said, the pebbles that were actually thrown at your tent during the night were not you or Ivan doing it. The guttural roar was not from you or Ivan, nor was the large footprint that you saw in the mud. Yes, Mum, they were real, although we all thought it was our elaborate hoax and that the campers were buying it, and they were. I wasted no time, Mum, in dressing up in my gorilla suit at about lunchtime, and Mum, I looked utterly amazing, because being tall, I rarely could pull it off, and I even stuffed my body up with fillers to make myself appear much more larger and more intimidating and more realistic. Both Ivan and Jessie said I looked the part and very scary and very realistic. So what did you do next? Well, I ran into the woods, Mum, and Jessie was going to whistle to me to let me know when the coast was clear and when it was a good time to perform my stunt. He was going to say to everyone, look over there, there's something moving behind that tree there. Did you not see that shadowy thing? And get everybody to look. And then I was going to make myself a wee bit visible and I was going to start swaying the foliage and showing them enough of myself to make them believe that they had indeed seen a Bigfoot. Oh, you are awful, Victor, I said, scaring everyone like this. <laughs> it's so typical of you. Victor continued, it was lunchtime and everybody was so engrossed in cooking sausages and burgers and chicken on the grill and they were all distracted by these preparations. So it was the perfect time. I remember how excited I was about the prank, which I'd been planning for weeks. I was waiting for the whistle and when I heard this very heavy sound, like something massive was walking through the undergrowth towards me. In fact, I thought this was a hoax that was being turned in on me. I also got the whiff of the most terrible, unimaginable odour. It was so vile and smelt like rotting garbage and faeces. Suddenly, I rarely did sense this formidable presence, and I looked up to see this huge creature staring down at me. And I mean, I'm six foot, Mum, and this creature was staring down at me. And it looked at me with a look of amazed surprise on its face. Mum, I knew that this thing was a Bigfoot, without a shadow of a doubt. I was in total shock because it was real. This thing was enormous, Mum. I've never seen anything so big in all my life. I was dressed in an ape's suit and it was just staring at me. And I think because I was wearing the ape suit, it was wondering what on earth I was because it was pretty realistic looking. And I think I made it very confused. How big was this creature? I asked. Well, I told you it was big. It was at least nine foot tall, about 800 pounds or possibly more. And it was about four and a half feet wide. It was covered in sandy brown hair and it had a cone-shaped head 
massive shoulders, virtually no neck, and the most huge torso that I've ever seen in my life. Mum, he would have made a bodybuilder look utterly pathetic, I promise you. The best way to describe him, Mum, was he looked exactly like an ape man. What about the legs and arms, I asked. Were they big too? He was massive all over, Mum, without any exceptions. His arms were much longer than a human arms and his hands were like owls, only infinitely larger, with fingers as big as sausages. The legs were shorter in length in comparison to the rest of his body, but they were long and big, if you know what I mean. And one thing he was, was very muscular. And the face, I asked, what about the face? I watched my son physically shape as he remembered the face and described it to me in detail. It was big, much bigger than ours is, and longer. No, it was very elongated. It was as if the skin was also grey in colour and the nose was flat but dark, very much like a dog's. The mouth was thin but the teeth were big and human-like and much, much bigger than ours. And the eyes, they were deep set and dark brown in colour. What did the creature do? He looked at me in such a strange way because I was wearing that gorilla suit and I think it was realistic looking as I was telling you before. So I think he was puzzled by what I was and didn't know quite how to react to me. When I saw the way he was looking at me, I suddenly began to realize that he could see me as a rival Bigfoot. So I immediately pulled off the gorilla face. Luckily, it was a separate part of my costume and I threw it on the ground towards him. You see, I needed him to see that I was human. I felt that would impose less of a threat than if I was a rival, Bigfoot. What did he do next, I asked. He picked up the ape head and he examined it closely and studied it for a while. He looked very puzzled and he even smelt it and grunted at it all the time and looked up at me curiously. I got the impression that he was terribly muddled and wasn't making sense of why I had been wearing this thing in the first place. After a while, he let out this huge thunderous roar and started pounding his chest like a drum. I knew immediately that that was like he was showing me who's boss. He didn't look happy, Mum. So I just stood there. I was paralyzed with fear and I felt sure he was going to kill me. So I know this sounds crazy, but I shut my eyes as tightly as I could and I looked at the ground to avoid his stare. And I just stood there. What did he do next? I asked. He grunted a few times, but I could sense he had calmed down. And then he just turned around and walked away. And as he walked, I could see he was carrying the gorilla head in his hands. And he was constantly feeling it with his hands and examining it all the time while he was walking. Mum, after he had gone, I wet myself. I stood there for a few minutes, barely being able to move. And then I heard Jessie whistling, but I didn't perform my stunt. Instead, I ran back to the camp, wearing nothing but my boxer shorts, because by then I'd pulled off my entire costume. And everyone saw me rushing into the tent, and they all thought I'd seen a ghost, because I looked so deathly pale. You poor, poor thing, I said, cradling my son into my arms and comforting him. I found out later, Mum, from Ivan, that he hadn't been the one pelting our tent that night. So it must have been the Bigfoot that I'd seen that had been doing all those stunts during the night. I then went to tell the supervisor everything that had happened the previous night and all about my encounter with that hairy beast. And he said that I was just making it all up and that I was trying to trick him and that it wasn't funny. He saw my gorilla suit minus the head and the stencil and he believed that I had been deliberately scaring everyone by pretending to be Bigfoot. He also had his tent pelted on the Saturday night and said that he'd known all along that it was me. He even told the boys about my hoax, and so when I told them about the real encounter, nobody believed me. Everybody said they knew how brilliant I was at performing stunts. And even Ivan was starting to doubt that what I was telling him was truthful. Mum, you were right. My hoaxing has come back to haunt me. My son looked at me and said, you know what is more extraordinary than anything else, mum, is that Bigfoot is real 
because I've seen him myself, and if I never see him again, it'll be too soon. That creature was utterly terrifying. I was also such stunned by my son's revelation. Like my son, I had also believed that this hairy creature, known as Bigfoot, was the stuff of myth and legends. And I believe what my son told me, even though he is the world's greatest hoaxer. And perhaps because of it. And now I was beginning to realize that those encounters that people experience with these creatures all around North America are definitely real. So there you are. That's my story. Do you know, I just want to say thank you so much for sending me the story. Isn't it so funny how you can perform a hoax and it can end up backfiring on you. Everybody began to believe that this Victor chap had performed this incredible stunt because he was so good at performing stunts in the first place. Until next time, goodbye and good night.